Good morning. I'm Brian Carr. I'm not Brian James. Um, I'm indeed honored and privileged to be here with you all this morning. Uh, I have been here a few times for district meetings. I have uh, served churches most recently in this district in the land. Uh, and it's just such a beautiful uh, campus. Uh, this is an incredible building. Even more, you're an incredible church. Uh, so I'm honored uh, to be here with you uh, this morning. And I am pushing 61. I'll be 61 in a few weeks. So it is not often that someone can use these words when they're almost 61. But I am the brand spanking new director of church relations for the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. Uh, and I uh, received a call uh, earlier in the week. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm surprised to be in this position. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit that, about that as we go on. But I'm certainly honored uh, to be here with you. And I know that you all have had a long, uh, close relationship with the Children's Home and, complete, and continue to partner with the Children's Home uh, in a variety of ways. So thank you uh, so much for that. I think we'll just get right into it. So let's pray. I am no longer my own, but yours, O Lord. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, most glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And may this covenant which I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. For I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse of the law for us. Hallelujah. Amen. So, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, I am from West Virginia. Uh, I am from a small town called Mullins uh, in southern West Virginia. And uh, interestingly enough, when I was, um, let's see, I was 23, uh, a, our church secretary handed me an application to go on a mission trip. And I accepted that application, not really knowing why, but I remember her words. She said, Brian, if anybody in this church is interested in this, it would be you. And I was first excited. Uh, it was called something like the Caribbean Crescent uh, Work Team. And then the more I read, the less excited, less excited I became because the next trip was going to be in Mexico. And I had grown up on John Wayne movies. And I knew how Mexicans were portrayed. And I know, knew what I had heard uh, and seen on TV. But the more I thought about this opportunity, the more I prayed about it, the more I knew it was for me. As a matter of fact, uh, over time, that application began to be like electric in my hands. Uh, so uh, on my first, um, so I went, uh, I signed up, I applied, I was accepted uh, and uh, even during the training, I heard a lot of negative things about Mexicans. Maybe the most memorable was, be careful what you say or they'll cut your ears off. And with this uh, mic this morning, that might be helpful if I'd had my, my head so big. And, but, but I went with a lot of fear and trepidation. And then I remember being in the uh, airport in Mexico City uh, and spinning around And just that moment, just looking at the airport and the people, I realized that everything that I had ever heard about Mexico had been a lie. 
And I went on to have an amazing experience living in a family's home for almost two weeks, and my life has never been the same. Uh, actually, that moment uh, has brought me eventually to this moment. Uh, another thing about that first day, uh, I met a young woman, uh, and I was so backward and so shy, I mean, I could not even uh, describe just how backward and how shy I was. I uh, met this young woman and uh, tried to speak with her in my broken Spanish. She spoke English much better than I did, um, but she went on her way. Uh, and later in the week, uh, actually on a Sunday morning, we were skipping Sunday school and going to an open-air market in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, and as I went around the corner, there she was. And as I avoided her, I was about to run over her, I tripped and fell on the sidewalk. And as all the guys with me were laughing, it's just classic Brian Carr, or you can call me Jethro mode. Um, as I was pushing up, uh, I looked back at her, uh, and uh, she smiled at me. And I knew, I knew there was something about her. I didn't know her name. I didn't know anything else about her. But I knew my heart was leaping. And uh, three years later, I, I went back uh, to work with the, United, with the Methodist Church in Mexico as an UMVIM, or a United Methodist Volunteer in Mission. Somewhere along the way, I met her for a second time. Didn't realize I'd ever met her before. But when we met, I knew. Uh, and I tell people now that I fell in love with my wife twice at first sight. Uh, and um, we married uh, a just a few months before my missionary service of three years ended in Mexico. I just want you to know that. Uh, my wife Lorraine and I have been married now for, uh, it'll be 32 years uh, in March. Uh, we have three beautiful daughters. Uh, our youngest is uh, uh, starting her senior year uh, in high school in Fort Pierce. Um, but in 1989, sometime in the late summer or fall, I began to receive correspondence uh, from a youth director in Orlando, uh, from First United Methodist Church, Orlando. Uh, and I remember we corresponded some by mail. We also spoke from time to time on the phone. Uh, no email back then. Uh, and um, their team was to arrive in mid-March of 1990. And I don't remember why, but for whatever reason, the, my boss in Mexico was a man named Carlos Romero, and he put this particular group uh, under my auspices uh, and uh, began to make plans uh, with uh, this youth director for a rather large team from First Orlando. And um, there were adults, there were college students, there were high school youth, uh, uh, maybe as many as 30 or 40. I can't remember exactly. Uh, but they left the planning to me, uh, which was unusual uh, for me in Mexico. I think one of the reasons perhaps was because the team agreed or planned on coming in on late on Friday night to Mexico City. I lived in Mexico City. Anyway, I had to take care of all the arrangements. Uh, and and uh, on that mid-March night uh, at the airport in Mexico City is when I met Brian James. Uh, Brian was the youth director uh, at First uh, Orlando. Uh, and that was a, a wonderful team. And that team impacted me, I think I can say honestly, more than any other team. Uh, I met several members of that team that I still have contact with. I think four people on that team went on uh, to, uh, uh, since the call to ordain ministry and are serving uh, in uh, different places uh, now. A and uh, several of them are just downright good friends of mine through the years. So much so that when Lorraine and I uh, were already married and we were thinking about where to live in the United States uh, as my term ended, uh, we chose Florida uh, because of them. And I ended up getting a job at uh, St. Luke's United Methodist Church as youth director. And we moved uh, to Orlando in 91. And then one of the first, I think it was the first retreat I ever took the kids to from St. Luke's to Leesburg, I ran into Brian James. 
And I remember we just looked at each other. It took us both a minute to figure out where we knew each other. And it just kind of stunned us that here we had made that leap uh, from Mexico um, to Florida. And then about 10 years later, uh, I was on a, t a trip to Cuba. And I was walking through a market in Havana. Uh, and who do I run into? Uh, Brian James. Uh, and, and then about, I would say, 10 years or so, eight or nine years after that, I discovered that this church uh, in, on the west coast of Florida uh, w had been taking mission trips to southern West Virginia uh, to my hometown, uh, to my home church. And who was the pastor of that church? Brian James. Uh, and Brian and I have never spent a whole lot of time with each other, but we keep kind of running into each other. Uh, and here we are this morning. And I'm very sorry that he's uh, under the weather, uh, but I am honored uh, to be here today. Uh, so this scripture uh, that was read so well just a few minutes ago from Jeremiah 29, uh, many of us may have one of those verses memorized. Um, and that's 2911. I know I memorized it a long time ago, uh, and it has remained very important to me. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Quite frankly, about 33 years ago, I was claiming that verse uh, for a wife. I was in Mexico, I was very lonely, um, didn't know how that would happen. Um, but I claimed that verse, and maybe many of you have claimed that verse. Uh, and I uh, know it's probably one of the most memorized verses. A few years ago, I was at a restaurant in uh, Port St. Lucie, and I had uh, um, a little notebook that had that verse written on it. And a uh, uh, server went by and said, hey, hey, that's my life verse. I, I love that verse. I memorized that verse. It's a great verse, isn't it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Hallelujah. What an awesome verse. Unfortunately, I had never paid much attention to the context. Uh, I had just uh, discovered this verse and, and read it and memorized it uh, and uh, clung to it, uh, but I hadn't paid much attention to where it came from. Uh, it, came, it comes from the book of Jeremiah, uh, a prophet. A prophet, we are told, who God called uh, while he was still in the womb. Uh, while he was, before he was born, uh, God later told him, I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. And I called you to be my prophet. And Jeremiah, as a young man, responds with, Lord, I am too young. I don't even know how to speak. And then God told him, what do you see? And he said, I see an almond branch uh, that's uh, flowering. God said, that means that I have my eyes on you and on Judah. Then he said, what do you see now? And he said, I see this huge pot of boiling liquid tilted toward us coming from the north. And he said, I am calling the nations from the north to dole out punishment on my people, on Judah, on Israel, for you have rebelled against me. You have chosen other gods you serve and worship other gods. You do not live like the holy people I have called you to be. You are living like everyone else. My plan was that you would be so in relationship with me that you would live holy lives, lives that would be so pleasing and so blessed that the nations of the world would be drawn to me through you. But look at you now. Judgment is coming. No sugar plums in his calling for Jeremiah. Jeremiah had harsh words for his people to wake them up, 
to get them to change their ways, to return to their God. And he did any number of things to get their attention. But Babylon arrived, and Babylon surrounded Jerusalem, and Babylon attacked and invaded and destroyed Jerusalem. By this time in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, uh, people have already been carried into exile, and they, are take, they were taken into captivity uh, to Babylon and beyond. Uh, and they had some prophets there in Babylon uh, that were telling them what they wanted to hear. Oh, this isn't any big deal. Uh, everything's going to be okay. Uh, soon, very soon, we will return to Jerusalem. But Jeremiah writes them a letter from Jerusalem, and he tells them that everything isn't okay. Uh, that they aren't going to return right away to Jerusalem. Uh, that they need to get settled in Babylon. They need uh, to just establish their homes. They need to work. Uh, they need to find husbands for their daughters and wives for their sons because they're going to be there for a while. They need to pray for the cities where they're being held in captivity. They're to pray for the prosperity, for the safety of those cities as they'll be praying for themselves as they live in those cities. The words of Jeremiah must have stunned them, must have cut them to the quick. Just think about them in captivity, knowing their lives that they were God's chosen people. Not only were they God's chosen people, but God lived in their city. God's dwelling place was the temple in Jerusalem. And now their city lay in ruins. Now the temple lay in ruins. Surely it made them wonder, where was God? Why didn't God protect us? Does God even exist? But Jeremiah and other prophets like him had been giving them the word for centuries. You've gone astray. You've rebelled against your creator. You've chosen other gods. You need to repent. Judgment is coming. Judgment is came and they found themselves exiles in a foreign land and now Jeremiah is telling them to settle down to settle in for 70 years but in the midst of that call he gives them this word for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That was his plan. That had been his plan all along. For them to seek him with all of their hearts. For them they would find him. And they would have relationship together. You know, I like 2911. I'll be honest, I don't necessarily like the 70 year part. You know, I want 2911 and I want it now. But when I look back on my life, I am glad that God unveiled his plan for me in the way that he did. I'm glad for those periods of isolation and sadness and loneliness. I am glad for those opportunities when, when I was forced to go beyond myself, to step out of my comfort zone and to trust God. Um, 
This is basically what this is about. Trusting God. Taking God at his word and trusting him. So for the last couple of years, I've been praying and fasting regularly, seeking God, uh, seeking what was going to come of me. And uh, on November 17th, 2021, it kind of interests me because I can't tell you the date that these uh, two um, navigator, navigator missionaries at West Virginia University led me to Christ. But I will never forget November 17th, 2021. Uh, that's when I realized God was telling me it was time for me to go. The truth is, I think I'd been hearing that for a while, but there were too many unanswered questions in that. Where would we live? What would I do? I'd already promised uh, our youngest daughter that regardless of what happened to me, we would not move out of the Port St. Lucie area so she could graduate from high school which certainly complicated the matter. And it was terrifying to think of stepping away. But in my heart, I knew that's what God was calling me to do. And perhaps the greatest act of my faith in my life was making that decision. Okay, I'm going to do it. And for quite a while, I didn't know what was going to happen. And then this opportunity to work at the children's home came to fruition. Really, at first blush, I turned it down. And then three months later, when I was approached about it again, everything seemed to just click in place. We needed a place to stay in the Port St. Lucie area for this next year. Out of the blue, a lady calls me from the church who, who is living out of the country and offered us her home. She wasn't interested in renting it or sell, selling it. She was interested in having someone stay there. Wow. God took care of the details. God had a plan. In 1994, uh, I was, uh, as a youth director, I was an adult volunteer at camp in Leesburg. Uh, and I had done it before, looked forward to it. I would lead a, a small group a couple times a day. Uh, and the other activities with the, the kids. But that was pretty much it. Uh, but in 1994, a week before I was to go to camp, I got a call. Uh, the adult who was supposed to volunteer with the water sports camp uh, had gotten ill and couldn't be there. So they asked me if I would be the point person for the water sports camp. Do I look like a water sports kind of guy? You know, I didn't grow up at the ocean. I didn't know how to swim. I'd never been skiing, um, and that was a lot of what we were going to be doing. But I told them, whatever you want me to do. And it turned out that a lot of our kids that week who had signed up for the water sports camp were from the children's home. And that was my first time rubbing elbows with children from the children's home. Sure, I'd seen them at an annual conference, and, and I'd heard them sing, but I had never really gotten to know any of them. I did that week. Uh, and it, was, uh, it wasn't uh, long after meeting them and spending time with them that I could just see uh, the hurt and the pain and the need in their lives in them. Um, it was a challenging week, uh, but a good week. And then, of course, about that time, I left for seminary and, and came back, and part of the pastor's orientation was to go to the children's home and be told the story. And then every fifth Sunday, you know, we would have the children's home in front of us. Sometimes we would do special projects with the children's home. Uh, and then three years ago, I was invited to serve on the board of trustees. Uh, and I got a whole new perspective, a different perspective of the children's home. I, I got to see a little closer the challenges uh, that the staff uh, were faced with. And you know, over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of challenges, even on top of those daily challenges. And I learned how much they pour themselves out for the children. Uh, and something began stirring in me, this deep appreciation 
for the ministry that goes on at the children's home and for the opportunities that the children's home give us, uh, the, the church, uh, to actually um, partner with them in a variety of ways, giving us opportunities to practice those bedrocks of our faith with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, our witness, giving us opportunities to make disciples and to stretch ourselves as disciples by partnering with the children's home. Certainly had uh, a new impact on our church in Port St. Lucie as we discovered new ways to partner, to grow with the children's home. So here I am, the director of church relations, uh, at the children's home, humbled uh, beyond belief that I get to work at a place where lives are transformed um, through day in, day out hard work. And you know, the children's home uh, started out as an orphanage in 1908, uh, but is far more than that now. The services that the children's home offer are varied and diverse from outpatient care uh, to foster care to emergency shelter. Uh, we have the Madison Youth Ranch up in Madison. We have an emergency shelter situation in West Palm Beach. We have the children's home here close by in Enterprise. Uh, but the services, there are a myriad of services that you may have never heard of. Uh, that are trying to impact children and youth and young adults uh, who have been so mistreated um, over the years. It's really a place of miracles. And part of my training, and I'm very much in training uh, right now, uh, I was given this book, uh, a, Under the Sheltering Tree, A Brief History of the Florida United Methodist Children's Home, 1908 to 2008, written by Stephen Hartsfield. And I, I want to read uh, a quote. Um, of course, I lost my place, but that's okay. Um, first, through the history, when you read the history, you will just see the incredible beginnings. Uh, plus, you will see how the mission, the mission has remained the same, but the ministry has changed. In the early days, they were just basically providing shelter, a safe place, uh, clothing, food, home. But as the decades went on, they began to notice things began to change. There weren't as many orphans coming as there were in the early years. In the 40s, uh, and I think this was nationwide, perhaps worldwide, uh, they noticed that there were deep uh, changes and that treatment needed to change uh, with the, the child. Uh, and even today, uh, treatment changes uh, often. Uh, but this was a, a segment from the 90s. Uh, and um, it was a quote from David, uh, Reverend David McIntyre. And I want to read this uh, to you. I think it captures uh, very well uh, the ministry and the miracle of the children's home. In the early 90s, I sat on the dock at the United Methodist Youth Camp in Leesburg with a young lady who at the time was a resident of the home. I was the senior high preacher for the week and she wanted to talk with me. She shared with me a glimpse of her past, of incredible terror each night in her home, afraid that her father would come again in the night and hurt her, as he had done many times before. She spoke about coming to the home, afraid that it would be a new hell for her, a prison for unloved, unwanted children. But she never found that. She cried, and I cried, as she told me about the first sunrise she ever noticed, the first person she ever trusted, the first real friend she ever had, all found at the children's home. Most of all, she said, I wanted you to know that I gave my heart to Christ tonight. A year ago, I hated God for my life. When I realized that the people at the home loved me in spite of my hate, something changed in me 
and it brought me to this night. For the first time, I know that I am loved. What a powerful witness uh, that is ongoing uh, at the children's home. As challenges grow, so does the power of the Holy Spirit working through us to impact those lives with the love of Christ. And uh, I'm not sure where the whole under the sheltering tree comes from, the name of this book. And uh, I see it a lot uh, at the children's home, in hallways, uh, in, in uh, pictures and plaques. Uh, but I've been thinking about under the sheltering tree. And it could certainly be one of those old, majestic, glorious oak trees there on the Enterprise campus, under the sheltering tree. But for me, it goes deeper than that. When I think of the sheltering tree, I'm drawn to the cross. I'm drawn to the cross where Jesus Christ suffered and died a gruesome death for each of us to redeem us, to buy us back, to forgive us, to bring us back into right relationship with him, with his death and with his resurrection to have a living relationship with the God of promise, the God who promises life with hope, with future, with success, an intimate personal relationship with himself. May we all find ourselves entering under the sheltering tree the cross of Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.